whether you're in person or we've got some folks joining us online, I want to welcome them as well. Uh, like Jordan said, we are wrapping up our Generous Life series. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk a little about, bit about what comes next. So go ahead and play that video for me. That's not all video. I'm going to just tease you with that little bit. Uh, but I want to invite you back for our Christmas series. And maybe you know somebody who, like me, um, is just not a big fan of the way that we do Christmas in modern uh, America. And I want to want to find a way to get back to something that is uh, more at the heart of what we have in store. And so uh, I want to invite you back. I want you to invite somebody to come and join you uh, for this series we're calling Advent Conspiracy. And um, like Jordan says, we've got some fun things in, involved in that. Um, kind of going to be a, a little mesmerized as you walk in next Sunday. It's going to be pretty awesome. All right. I think all of us here today could agree that we all want to be blessed by God. You're having a lot of little, um, little gizmos or little uh, uh, fuzzies in our, electric, or our audio system right here, so just kind of ignore them. Um, but I think we could agree that, right? We all want to be blessed, right? I mean, that, that, we all would say that. Like, I want to be blessed by God. But what is a blessing, right? And, and how do we know what a blessing is? How do we know that we are blessed? A quick uh, search online pointed uh, me to a, a hashtag on Instagram. There are 150 million posts on Instagram, hashtag blessed. When I looked through them, I, I'm not quite sure that the people got, uh, what they, uh, got to the point of what it means to actually be blessed. If we think about being blessed in our lives as simply something that's material or possession-based, I think it's my pack. I think my little gizmo here is a little wiggly this morning. We'll try it. And see it is. That's exactly what it is. There we go. Try it. But if we, if we think that that's what it is, if we think that blessings are worldly success or maybe even luck, then our understanding of what it means to be blessed is pretty temporary and, and shallow, right? To what it actually means to be blessed. And I think the words of Inigo Montoya said it best, I don't think you know what the word means that you are using, right? Like, you use this word, but I don't think that we know what it means to be blessed. Biblically, blessings are, are blessings that come from God. We would never call them shallow or temporary. And there, there's a great blessing that we are to experience in this life, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The words the first words in the book of uh, Psalms actually talk about a blessing. It says, blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers. But the blessed person is delighted in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water, which yields its fruits in season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever it does, or whatever he does, or they do, prospers. This is a blessed life. Paul writes about what it means to be blessed when he says, Blessed be the God of our Father, our God and Father, our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. One writer said, Being blessed implies that we are receiving God's favor and approval. It's an acknowledgement of God's graciousness towards us. 
And so maybe we're in a situation and we see God's hand. Sometimes we call that his favor. And we realize that in that moment, we are being blessed for sure. But what Paul writes about to the Christians in Ephesus is something that's more deeper and impactful in our lives. He's talking about spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings that come from our faith in Jesus. Blessings that aren't just here for today or even here for tomorrow, but blessings that await us in heavenly places. Because of what Jesus has done for us, the grace that has been extended to us through Jesus' work on the cross, we have received the greatest blessing that we would ever receive, that we could ever receive, right? We've been made right with God. We've been given an opportunity to have a relationship with him. And if all of our blessings ended right there at that point, we would still be the most blessed people in the world. But that's not where they end. There's more to it. And if you've not received this great blessing, then we would love to help you. If you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, we want to talk to you about it. We want to help you make that decision, and we would love to help you. And, and you can see either Jordan or I after the service, and we'd love to talk to you about that. But this morning, we're wrapping up our Generous Life series. And I hope you understand that generosity is more than just the money that we are called to give. Generosity is a way of life. We want to be generous people who are generous with our time because we've created time. We've made time to be generous. We want to be generous with our talents because we understand that God has given us talents in his great love for us. He has sent the Holy Spirit. He has filled us with his spirit and given us talents and gifts to be used for the kingdom. But there's also the treasure that we've been blessed with that we're supposed to do something with. And, and we're going to talk more about that today. We want to find ways to be generous daily, right? Generous with our words and, and with our actions. We want, to be, we want to find ways to help people. And often that requires more than just giving them a few bucks as you are exiting the plaza at Publix or make, trying to make a turn on 312, right? At Homeport, we, we want to offer multiple opportunities for us to find ways to be generous. There was a mound of food over here last week, and, um, and it was really amazing um, because usually the way that it works out is that this whole area would be filled, and we'd get to the end of collecting or putting together the meals that we need, and we'd have just about what we need. And when we looked at the, the pile this week uh, leading in, there was a little bit of trepidation as to whether or not we were going to fill 30 baskets right? There was a little bit of us looking at it and going, oh, I just don't know if we quite made it this year. Um, but God did something with that mound of food. And now he not only filled all the 32 meals that we needed, but we took boxes of food with us. There was more than we needed. It didn't look like it, but there was more than we needed because we chose generosity and we offered God an opportunity to do something with us, right? And so we donated all of these meals. We've, um, on Thursday, we donated um, 30 meals to the local middle school and 30 frozen turkeys to go with them. Uh, we've got two more uh, meals that we'll be providing and putting together here this week for some folks as well. Um, you know, we, we just create, we want to create these little ways for us to be generous, whether it's putting together the, the Thanksgiving meals. We have a dollar club in the back where those funds go to homeless students here in our community. Um, we've got our BOGO bin in the lobby. If you're out and about and you're shopping through and, and there's some kind of uh, pantry good or you know, non-perishable and it's buy one, get one free, we'd love for you to buy one and give one. And so we've got a bin in the lobby for God's Kitchen, which is one of our ministries uh, that we've partnered with here at Homeport. And when we all pitch in, when we all choose generosity, it's amazing what we can accomplish together. It's way more than we could ever imagine. And when we use our time and our talents to serve God and his church, and we, oper we open this place up and we make it a place where people feel welcome and that they can belong here, and when others are able to worship at the foot of God's throne because of what we have done and what we've put together, where people grow deeper in their love for God, 
These are marks of a generous life. And it takes all of us working, doing our part to put it together. But there's something tied to our generosity that I think often we overlook. And it's the promise of a blessing. There are blessings that are promised that come from being generous. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is what Paul is writing. He says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat, in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those in need, they will thank God. And so two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in, Jer in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. And as a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, Paul is writing to the church about a gift that they have decided they want to help participate in and give to the church in Jerusalem. There has been a famine that is over the whole region of Jerusalem, and so the churches are banding together all these brand new churches that are being planted across um, the Mediterranean are banding together and they're sending resources back for their brothers and sisters in Christ there. And so Paul is talking about this gift that is being collected. And in these two chapters, Paul gives some instructions, and we're going to look at a little bit more of them today. But it's no coincidence that we're talking about faith promise and our commitments that we'll be making for 2024 and, 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 and how those commitments are going to be used to support our mission partners at Homeport when we read these verses. See, the commitments that, that you'll be making go to fund these, these partners, just like the, the churches were doing in Jerusalem. They were helping their brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and we, we set out last year and we set a goal that we thought was attainable and God blew it out of the water. We, we set a goal um, of about 25,000. The year before, we had given a little over 20,000, and we were trying to be um, thoughtful and generous, and then we collected uh, commitments of $59,000 last year, right? And we are, we are marching towards that uh, as we continue to give through uh, November and, and into December uh, to reach all of our commitment for Faith Promise this year. And so you'll be taking your commitment cards and um, you'll be filling them out. And, and maybe where you are is the same place you were last year. And that's okay, right? Like, there, there's no, like, we've got to go bigger and we've got to go home. Like, no, 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 no. Like, you've got to make a decision. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. Uh, you've got to make a decision on what you can do and how you can participate uh, in our missions. And maybe God has blessed you with more this year over last year. And so you can. Or maybe you didn't participate at all, and we would love for you to be a part of that. Like Jordan said, the commitment cards that are in your, um, in your rows don't have names on them. We are not going to track you. We're not going to track your giving. Um, this is a commitment between you and the Lord because you want to be generous. Because you want the blessing that comes from that. These verses that Paul is writing, he's wanting them to see that God will bless them for their generosity. He says, you're going to have everything that you need and then some for people that are in need. Because that's the way that God works. God is going to increase your resources, he says. He's going to produce a harvest of generosity in you. And so when we choose to be generous, we're showing what Paul says is our obedience to the good news our obedience to God, because we understand how much he gave up so that we could be saved. And so we give of ourselves and our resources to help others because we understand that. And when we choose to be generous, there are at least three types of blessings that I want to talk about this morning that we receive. The first one 
is we receive spiritual blessings. Through our generosity, our character becomes more like Christ or more Christ-like. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 and 9, he says, Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, and your knowledge, and your enthusiasm, and your love for us, he says, I also want you to excel in the gracious act of giving. He says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You will know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, or you know the generous grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Paul is calling us to excel in the ministry of giving, in this gracious act, he calls it. It's not a command. He's not commanding us to do it. But he knows that there is a, a tie between our genuine love and our eagerness to help. And then he's talking about how through Jesus' death, he says Jesus, though he was rich, Jesus stepped out of the glory of heaven for you and I, right? I mean, the most perfect place ever. He stepped out of it into a broken world. And it says, for your sake he became poor. So that by his poverty, he could make you rich. And we have to realize that that as Christians, we are truly blessed. Blessed beyond measure. The most blessed people in the world. And when we choose to be generous, Paul says we're acting like him. It's changing our character. We're becoming Christ-like. We're living out our mission to passionately live like him. And we're finding ways that through our giving, we can help others find these spiritual blessings that we have. He says generosity leads to these spiritual blessings that are with us forever. A few years ago, I remember the actor Jim Carrey saying this. He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous. I think think everybody should have everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. Right? We sit and we fantasize that if we had enough money, all of our, our worries would go away. I think Jim Carrey probably made more zeros than we think we need to be happy in our life, right? And he said it's not the answer. The second blessing that we receive is an emotional blessing. And it helps, generosity helps us move from this financial anxiety that we can feel to a place of trust in our Heavenly Father. In Matthew chapter 6, he says this, he says, So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. So seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. He strips away that anxiety and all these worries that are upon ourselves. Jesus says that those worries dominate the minds of unbelievers because they don't know a God who can provide for them. Their gods were useless. No matter what they did, no matter how well they worshiped them, They would never do anything for them. They could never do anything for them. And we look around and we see lives that have been ruined by money, by the pursuit of money and the love of money. But somehow we think that we would be different if we got a hold of it. And yes, there are Christians that are wealthy, and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy as a Christian. But I think if we got to know them and we got to see their lives we would realize that their lives aren't dominated by how many dollar bills are in their bank account or the nicest car they have or or the clothes that they wear, right? I think we would see people who are focused on God, who are seeking him, and how they can use their wealth to be a blessing. 
And so for us to get away from this rat race of changing money and all the emotional baggage that Jesus is talking about, we've got to believe that there's a God in heaven who can take care of all of our needs, that he can meet our needs, that, that we will be provided for, and we have to trust him so that we stop it, that we don't chase those things anymore, that we do seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that we live like it, and we believe in this promise that he will provide for all of our needs. There's emotional and spiritual blessings. There's also financial blessings that do come. A life of generosity helps us align our finances with God's wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. In verse 9 he says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the best part of everything you produce. And then he will fill your barns with grains and your vats will overflow with good wine. How are we honoring the Lord with our wealth? How are we trusting him with all of our heart and trusting his ways and following his will as we seek him? How are we letting him show us what our path is to be and the the path that we're supposed to take and trusting that he's going to provide as we go along it? right? I don't know what full barns and vats of wines look like in 2023 in in this part of America, at least, right? I I don't know um, that he promises that we're we're all going to be rich, and I know that he doesn't promise that we're going to have carefree lives, but I know that we can trust his word and trust his promises. And I know at my life, I've felt that there were times that my barn has been full and my vats have been overflowing, but if you looked at my bank account, you wouldn't see a bunch of zeros, and if you looked at my retirement account, you'd probably laugh or feel sorry for me, but that's okay, right? From the very beginning of our marriage, Dawn and I have tried to do this. With the little bit that we had, and if I told you what I made as a part-time minister, again, you would laugh, um, right? But we've tried to take, even from that little bit that we had, in the very beginning, through our whole marriage, and tried to honor God with our wealth, and the blessings that we received far outweigh any gold or silver that we could have earned in that meantime, right? I don't know what those full barns and, and vats look like, but I know what they feel like. I know what it feels like to be blessed. Like I said a few minutes ago, towards the beginning, I, I want to look at what Paul's instructions were to the church. Like, he was giving instructions to the church in Corinth about the collection that they would take. And I think there's some stuff in there for us to help us understand what it means to be blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. And the first one is, is what is your plan for being generous? We all should have a plan for being generous. The first time Paul writes to the church in Corinth about this, uh, collection he writes in First Corinthians chapter 16, and he says this, Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave the church in Galatia. So there were multiple churches participating in this. On the first day of the week, each of you should put aside a portion of money that you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and try to collect it all at once. Paul has encouraged them to have a plan, to set aside a portion of what they've earned for this so that when he comes, it's ready. And and this portion and this setting aside is going to look different for all of us. You may take the money that you've earned, you may go to the bank, you may get cash, you may put it in an envelope, and you may bring that in with you because that is what works for you, right? Some people get paid once a month, and so we wouldn't ask them to set aside. We'd ask them to do it, to make a plan for that, right? Some people uh, may bring a check, or maybe they give online. Online giving is a, is a great way to set up giving so that it's the first thing that comes out of our bank account. And if you go into our giving link, which is homeportcc.org slash give, you can give one time if that's what, how you feel that you're supposed to give, or you can set up recurring giving because your giving really doesn't change week to week, right? You've, you've already made the decision of what portion you're going to give 
and you set it up so that it's the first thing that comes out. Before any of your other bills, you get paid, and then the church, uh, you send your giving in. Whatever works for you, but it starts with having a plan for giving. And whatever that plan is, we should stick to it. The second thing that Paul talks about is giving in proportion to what you have. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, Now you should finish what you have started. Let your eagerness in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and, and hard for yourself. I only mean that there should be some equity. Right now you have plenty and can help those that are in need, and later they will have plenty and can share with you when you are in need. In this way, things will be equal. And then in chapter 9, verse 6, he says this. He says, remember, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So you must decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver. Part of your plan is deciding on what you're going to give. Paul says it should be in proportion to what you have, right? Not what you don't have. That's why there aren't requirements to it. He wants it to be equal. I think not that we're required to give a tithe. The tithe is a good place to start because it's a percentage. And that percentage looks different for all of us. But we can give that percentage, we can give that proportion, if that's what God has laid on our hearts. We're to give eagerly, we're to give cheerfully. But he wants you to decide what you're going to give. Because that's what matters to God. Is that we've had this conversation with ourselves, that we've worked through what generosity looks like, and so... We we make a plan. We make a plan for our general fund giving for the church, and we make a plan for what our faith promise giving is that's over and above. Not to make it easy for some and hard for others, but it's an act of worship that we give. It's it's a part of what it means to be generous. We want us to be generous people with all of our life with all of our time and our talents, our treasure. We want this holistic idea of generosity to be there in our life because this is what it means to be a growing and maturing Christian. And so my last question is for you this morning is, is what's preventing you from living the generous life? What's keeping you from these blessings that God has, has promised? How can we live generously just as we've been called to live. Why don't you guys pray with me this morning? Father, we come before you as we look at our own lives and we do some introspection. Father, we know that your hand is uh, upon us. We can see the way that you are working um, just in our lives, the favor that you've shown, the way that you've been in situations that we didn't know how we would get out of. Father, I I pray that you would help us to see the blessings that you have given us. And this morning, as we look at our own lives, Father, I pray that your spirit would work in us and that you would help us make a plan for how we can be generous back to you. Father, I thank you so much for the generosity of this congregation, for the over and above that you have um, just moved in our, in our hearts so that we could see your kingdom advance, so that we could see more people coming to Christ. We could see people growing deeper in their faith, see your word being spread around the world in ways that we could have never imagined on our own. Father, we thank you for our, our missions partners and the work that they're doing. And Father, that they would be blessed and that you would be glorified because of our giving to faith promise. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the ultimate gift. Help us to make our lives more like him.
And we pray these things in his name.